Who's your commander? Good luck. Equip. Move to combat. Resolves. Okay. Now, before you attack Does anyone have an answer? Well played. Good game. Hello everyone, my name is DJ. This is the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel. And today we're talking about our Be Better at Commander series. That's right, I'm gonna help you get better at playing this game through these interesting discussions. And today, my advice to you is play more fours. Actually, we're gonna have an in-depth discussion about curve and what you can do to impact the battlefield at relevant times so that you can better pressure your opponents. But before we jump into that, I wanna thank the sponsor of the Jumbo Commander YouTube channel, Cool Stuff Inc. If you wanna pick up more four drops, head on over to their website, and when you do, use the coupon code JUMBO5, because that's gonna save you 5% off your order. All right, so what do you mean by play more fours? My advice of running more fours is actually a reaction to a change in the commander metagame, the larger metagame. All right, look at this. This is EDH Rec over here. These are the top cards. And I was looking to see if three mana mana rocks were making it in anymore. And so if we go down, we're gonna see all of the signets. We're gonna see all of the talismans. We're gonna see all this two mana green ramp right here. We're gonna see things like, you know, Lanoir Elves, Felwar Stone, Growth Spiral, Dockside, Dark Noble Hierarch, One Mana Dorks, things like that. We have to go all the way down here to Commander Sphere, which is the 98th most played card. Yeah, a couple years ago, like we had a lot of three mana rocks on here and they're just going out of favor. And so if the entire world is getting rid of three mana rocks and replacing them with two mana rocks, well, what is that doing to our curve in our commander deck? And are we really utilizing that early ramp? So if your deck has a critical mass of two mana ramp, you have to ask yourself, what are you doing on turn three with four mana? I wanna ask you, what are you doing with four mana? I mean, if you've gone through all of this effort to ramp on two and not on three mana, but on two, what are you doing with four? I mean, just pick up your commander deck and go through it and say, okay, you know, how am I, how is this game theoretically playing out? You know, if I get to four mana one turn earlier, how am I pushing? What am I doing? And that could lead you to believe that while maybe two mana ramp isn't as important in this deck as you might think, and maybe you put in a more flexible or powerful three mana mana rock, or maybe you go the other direction and play more fours. Look, development is important for the game of Commander. The more mana we have, the more mana we can use on subsequent turns, and that can launch us ahead of our opponents. Card draw is also important. We're not you know, defined by just exactly what we can draw off the top of our deck, we can pick and choose exactly what's right for the right situation. But there are some decks out there, I'm looking at many of you, that just ramp and card draw so much that they don't impact the board. And I think I've had some of these discussions recently over a card that I think is phenomenal and other people are less excited about. It's the Battle Angels of Tear. The Battle Angels of Tear is two white white for a four four angel knight with flying and myriad. When the angels deal combat damage to a player, draw a card if that player had the most cards in hand, create a treasure if that player had the most lands, then gain three life if that player had the most life. Now, I'm not here to get into an argument about whether the Battle Angels of Tear are good. They, they are good, they're very good. Um, but the back and forth that I had in many situations was, well, it's, it's just a 4-4 flyer. I mean, Commander's about so much bigger stuff, you know? It's, it's just a 4-drop, you know? But I think that 4-drops are excellent, and 4-drops are necessary. And when you get them out early, your opponents, they need to respect it, because Battle Angels of Tear deals 12 damage a turn. I know it's spread out across your opponents, but that's a lot of damage and damage can end games. I think a lot of times we're fixated on these big plays and big synergies and building this Rube Goldberg machine of a deck, but in actuality, smashing people in the air with angels can let you win your game of commander. 
All right, join me on a tour of my favorite four drops. First up, let's talk about a classic white card that impacts the board. In fact, people define this as a card that can win the game on its own, it's Hero of Bladehold. Two white white for a three four human knight with battle cry. Whenever Hero of Bladehold attacks, put two one one white soldier creature tokens on the battlefield tapped and attacking. Hero of Bladehold just catapults into more and more damage, and honestly, people need to answer it. But you know what? Hero of Bladehold might not fit in every single white four drop slot, because having Battle Cry means that it needs to be a little bit of an aggressive attacky deck in order to take advantage of that to the fullest. I actually think that Court of Grace will fit in most white decks a little bit better. Court of Grace is too white white for an enchantment. When Court of Grace enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. The monarch is fantastic, but there's more text on this. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. If you're the monarch, create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying instead. This just giving you the monarch early on in the game is fantastic because people are not likely to be able to take it back from you. And if you are passing the monarch around, that's fine because you have 1-1 spirit creature tokens with flying that lets you get the monarch back and keep that card draw going. Court of Grace is gonna easily replace itself and then gain value over the course of a game, generating these 1-1 one, one tokens or these hopefully 4-4 four, four angels. And by the way, if you're building a deck that's designed to impact the battlefield, like I'm suggesting you do, the Monarch is gonna be particularly good for you. You're gonna hold it more often than not, and you're gonna keep that card advantage. And even if you do pass the Monarch around, that's fine, because as a strategy that impacts the board and has creatures to turn sideways, you are okay with everyone reducing life totals a little bit at the cost of a couple cards. Let's go on to red with Tectonic Giant, because this is kind of like Myriad. <laughs> Tectonic Giant is two red red for a 3-4 elemental giant. Whenever Tectonic Giant attacks or becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, choose one. Tectonic Giant deals three damage to each opponent, or exile the top two cards of your library, choose one of them, until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. Tectonic Giant gives you card advantage, which is great. I love that it's play and not cast, so it means you can hit lands, you can set up your land drop, and it's up until next turn. So I can see many situations where you plan out your next turn and you get to choose between two cards. That's pretty solid setup and card draw on a red creature. But if we're talking about just pressuring life totals, this does 12 damage as well. You swing at someone and then boom, three damage, three damage, three damage. This is similar sort of power stats to the Battle Angels of Tear that I'm clearly in love with. So obviously Tectonic Giant being able to pivot between huge damage, pressuring life totals, and setting up your next turn's draw means that Tectonic Giant coming down early and attacking a lot is gonna be good for you. Let's go on to another one. We've got Maniform Hellkite. Two red red for a 4-4 four, four dragon with flying. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create an XX red dragon illusion creature with flying and haste, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast that spell. Exile that token at the beginning of the next end step. So on its own, this is just a 4-4 four, four flyer. We're gonna see a lot of those <laughs> four damage flyers. So it does all the things and has the pressure that I've been talking about. What Maniform Hellkite lets you do if you get it down on turn three is take your subsequent turns to develop your mana, develop your hand, smooth everything out. But as you do it, pressure so much because it's just gonna create those hasty dragon illusions over and over and over again. Let's talk about another four drop that synergizes with spells, God Eternal Kefnet. Two blue blue for a four five flying zombie god. You may reveal the first card you draw each turn as you draw it. Whenever you reveal an instant or sorcery card this way, copy that card and you may cast the copy. That copy costs two less to cast. It's also hard to get rid of God Eternal Kefnet because if it were to die or whatever, you can put it third from the top of your library. This is gonna synergize really well with all those subsequent instants and sorceries. And remember, this is card draw. If you're casting a copy, you're getting that card into your hand to cast at a later date. And so God or Total Kefnet will gain you value in certain types of decks over and over again. Next, we have one of my only multicolored cards on this list. It's Nicobolus the Ravager. It's a little bit harder to have multicolored cards playing on curve, but if you're ramping with the right kind of ramp and you're fixing properly and have a developed mana base, then you should be fine getting Nicobolus on the battlefield on turn three. Nicobolus the Ravager is one blue, black, red for a 4-4 four, four flying elder dragon. 
When Nicobolas the Ravager enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. It also has an activated ability that costs a lot of mana. Four blue, black, red, transform it, and it transforms into a big planeswalker. You can tick it up to draw two cards, you can tick it down to destroy something or reanimate something, and it does have an ultimate. Nicobolas immediately rips cards from your opponent's hand. I like that. Now, granted, attacking your opponent's hand with non-targeted discard early in the game is less effective because your opponents have more choices about what to discard. You know, Nicobolas coming down in the late game when everyone only has one card in hand, their haymaker they're hanging on to, is a little bit better. But that's okay because Nicobolas just needs card advantage in order to be good. And it can't stick around on the battlefield because turning it into a planeswalker is game ending. People are gonna need to answer Nicobolas because there's always that threat looming on the battlefield. Has me thinking of a green card, Uvenvald Oddity. Two green green for a 4-4 four, four, trampley hasty beast. And you can pay five green green to transform Uvenvald Oddity into Uvenvald Behemoth, which is an 8-8 eight, eight beast horror with trample and haste, and it gives other creatures you control plus one plus one trample and haste. Now I know the transformed side is not as powerful as many other overrun effects, but it's gonna create a tension on the board where people are wondering, well, are they just gonna transform it and turn it into this big thing that's a tremendous threat? And in the meantime, Uvenvald Oddity has been coming down and slamming in fast, dealing for every turn pressuring your opponents. That hasty four power also has me thinking of Questing Beast. Two green green for a four four legendary beast with Vigilance, Death Touch, and Haste. Questing Beast can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Combat damage that would be dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented. And whenever Questing Beast deals combat damage to opponent, it deals that much damage to target Planeswalker that player controls. Of all the text on Questing Beast, I think I like that damage done to Planeswalkers the most. And that's actually one of the big reasons why I want to impact the battlefield early on, is that I don't want an opponent's Planeswalker to just gain value turn after turn after turn. And by the way, there's a reason why I don't have Planeswalkers on this list. If your opponents are all super dirtily, then yes, four drop planeswalkers can definitely take over a game and fulfill many of the roles that I'm talking about. But all it takes is one other person at your table to heed my advice and play a card like Questing Beast to suddenly punish your planeswalker play. And I'm a fan of all of you playing cards that punish greedy planeswalker plays. You know, someone taps out for a planeswalker that they've ramped into, and then bam, you've Uvenvald oddityed and taken it out, or questing beasted and done damage and taken out that planeswalker so that they haven't recouped the value of their early four drop. Of course, one good thing about planeswalkers is that they usually diversify the threats. Like they have the planeswalkers a threat, and a lot of the times they're going to make creature tokens or have you draw cards. And so you've diversified your value on the battlefield. You know, Questing Beast and Uvenvald Oddity, they're just creatures and they can get caught up in a board wipe like a lot of the other creatures that I've mentioned. And so one thing that you can do is diversify your threats. I like a card like Azika's Chariot. Azika's Chariot is three and a green for a four, four legendary vehicle with crew four. When Azika's Chariot enters the battlefield, create two, two, two green cat creature tokens. When Azika's Chariot attacks, create a token that's a copy of target token you control. So a board wipe might take out just your cats, but you still have the powerful chariot left around. If someone has an artifact removal, you're sad, but at least you have some kitty cats. And Azika's Chariot can help build an army on its own, not to mention synergies with creating other more relevant tokens. Let's talk about some more board wipe insurance in black. Kalitas, Traitor of Get. Two black black for a 3-4 vampire warrior with lifelink. If a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, instead exile that card and create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Two and a black, sacrifice another vampire or zombie, put two plus one plus one counters on Kalitas Traitor of Get. I like that this just does damage, gains you life, but it has this clause that'll create you a bunch of zombies and interrupt your opponent's graveyard shenanigans. So if Kalitas gets caught up in a board wipe, everything's gonna die, but all your opponent's creatures will be exiled and you'll be left with a little army of two two zombies, allowing you to keep your board presence. I like that. 
Finally, we have Rankle, Master of Pranks, two black black for a 3-3 legendary fairy rogue with flying and haste. Whenever Rankle, Master of Pranks deals combat damage to a player, choose any number. Each player discards a card, each player loses life and draws a card, each player sacrifices a creature. Usually you can use one or all of those modes to your advantage. I mean, to quote the Oracle text, if you really want, you can choose zero modes for Rankle's triggered ability, but carefully consider the hidden costs in not entertaining someone titled Master of Pranks. I think you're gonna find some great use out of Rankle because you can choose different modes according to who you're playing. Like sometimes just having everyone discard a card over and over again can punish a lot of those decks that are trying to save up towards bigger drops or ramp into bigger things. So these are some of my favorite four drop plays, things that I have in my commander decks and I've seen do a lot of work. But these are not the only four drops out there. You could have your own favorite fours and ones that fit into your strategy in your commander decks, but how do you know if that four drop is accomplishing what you want it to? Well, let's look at some of the common threads of the cards I'd mentioned, and then you can evaluate your own four drops and find out if they're doing what you want them to do. I want my four drops to change the battlefield, to hit the battlefield and either be able to pressure opponents' life totals, pressure planeswalkers, do things. And a lot of times just an enchantment that draws you a card every turn doesn't do enough. I definitely appreciate a creature that can smash. You know, I got a bunch of them on here that just turn sideways, threaten life totals, take out planeswalkers, awesome. But you'll notice that a lot of them have some way of replacing themselves, you know? They'll draw you a card, they'll make your opponents discard something, they'll generate a series of creatures or have staying power on the battlefield. And that's what I also want out of a four drop, just diversify a little bit because there is a chance that these creatures are threatening enough to eat the first removal spell. So if you're breaking down your commander deck and looking at your curve, looking about how you impact the board in the early game, consider reevaluating your fours, finding out if you're really utilizing that slot and if you're ramping on two, are you impacting the board soon enough? Let me know in the comments down below what you think of my advice or what your favorite four is, hopefully one that smashes your opponents. Also, thanks again to Cool Stuff Inc. Remember that coupon code JUMBO5 to save 5%. I also wanna thank my patrons, they're amazing. They support me every single day. Thank you, patrons. And thank you for watching this video. I hope you all have a really good one. Bye-bye.